Inspired by a, brief, by a brief but profound mystical experience he had at the age of 14, Stephen Lane Taylor has been a lifelong student of metaphysics. In 1994, Stephen began taking formal courses in metaphysics through the Unity Institute in Lee's Summon, Missouri. Then, from 1996 to 2004, he taught a weekly class on metaphysics, yeah, easy for you to say, <laughs> metaphysics at a Unity church in Dallas, Texas. My, my tongue got in the way of my eye tooth and I couldn't see what I was saying. In 2006, Stephen moved to Sedona with his lovely wife, Carol. Carol soon joined the staff at the University of Sedona, where both Stephen and Carol earned their bachelor's degree in 2009. Stephen has been the guest speaker at more than 90 New Thought churches in 16 states, and he has been invited to speak at six national New Thought conferences. Stephen's ministry focuses on helping people learn how to recognize and cooperate with the divine flow of life, a flow that is continually guiding us toward the effortless fulfillment of our heart's desires. He has published three books on the subject, and his work has been featured in numerous metaphysical publications. Today, Stephen continues to teach people how to stop struggling with life and live life the way it is meant to be lived, effortlessly and joyfully. Let's all welcome Reverend Stephen Taylor. Thank you, Dick. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be addressing you today and an honor to be among the first to do so. I'd like to start my talk today by telling you just a little bit about myself. Uh, I have been a professional writer for my entire adult life. I spent 30 years as an advertising writer, uh, creating magazine advertisements, radio spots, TV commercials for clients like American Airlines, JCPenney, and Subaru, and, and many more. But in 2001, I got laid off. And instead of staying in the advertising business, I then segued over into being a full-time spiritual author, as Dick mentioned, uh, publishing three books since 2004. Now, the only reason I tell you this is so you'll, you'll understand that I'm a person who really does enjoy and appreciate a clever turn of phrase or a, a witty wordplay. And one of my favorites is something I came across in about 1994, maybe 1995, and that was this. The only constant in life is change. The only constant in life is change. Now, I really liked that statement because of the, the paradox of change and constancy and the juxtaposition of those two things. But I'm really surprised by how long it took for me to realize that that statement isn't true. The only constant in life is change? The only constant? That's not true. There's also death and taxes. Okay, <laughs> bad joke. You know what I'm getting at though, right? I mean, there is another constant in life that is much greater than change, or death, or taxes. And that is the constancy of God. You know, God is the constant that not only helps us weather change and deal with it and cope with it, but come out better on the other end, to benefit from it. But I'm going to get back to that at the end of my talk. What I really want to do with you today is to explore the, this phenomenon of change and why we seem to experience so much of it. Uh, it's something that I'm interested in particularly because it relates to a particular aspect of my ministry that I really hadn't even noticed or thought about for a long time. Uh, Dick mentioned this in the introduction, that my ministry is focused on helping people recognize and understand and cooperate with the divine flow of life, which I call an underlying current that's continually guiding us towards the effortless fulfillment of our heart's desires. But let me be clear about what I mean by heart's desires. You know, I don't mean something you just really, really want. I'm talking about a true desire of your heart, of your spirit, of your soul. A desire that may be far greater and grander than anything your ego will allow you to imagine for yourself. A desire that's always in the best interest of all, not just you. And a desire that may be directly related in some way to your purpose for being in this world, for your, for your soul's purpose, for your reason for living. Uh, so that is what you're being guided to, that kind of desire. 
You get guided through your intuition, through the intuitive wisdom of other people, through divine signs and synchronicities. Now, here's the thing. Along the way, you know, I have collected countless stories about people who have followed their divine guidance and fulfilled their heart's desires effortlessly. However, however, I noticed after a while that if you ask some of those people how they are enjoying, you know, living their heart's desires, many times they will say, you know what, I'm no longer living that dream or I'm not living that dream in the same way because something changed. Something changed. Why? Why would God guide you to something that's the, the, your soul's purpose or fulfillment of your heart's desire only to have it be fleeting for something to change and for it to dissolve away? Well, there's many reasons for that, uh, and I'd like to t share with you today about six of them, if I have time, uh, and leading up to the last one, which is the one that Dr. Masters talks about most frequently. So, here's the first reason that something may change on you even after you have followed divine guidance and manifested something miraculously in your life. Because of decisions made by your ego at that point. Decisions made by your ego. You know, it's very easy to uh, follow the divine flow, you know, follow divine guidance, your intuition, uh, manifest something miraculously, know that you were guided by God there. But then at some point, you say, I did it. I did it. Oh, you did it, did you? Your, your ego did it? Not God did it in and as through you? Not by following God's guidance you did it? Not by uh, God's blessing of God's grace you did it, but you did it? You know, it's very easy to sort of slip into that mindset and forget that, as Dr. Masters says, God is the doer. And begin to let ego slowly take over, take charge again, and start making decisions. And my friends, the ego makes terrible decisions <laughs> all the time. These decisions are always limited in nature. They're always self-serving. Uh, they're, they're, just, they're just pretty lousy overall. And if you do that, if you end up making these decisions that the ego makes, sometimes based on fear, of course not on love or faith, you can start to undermine the very thing you co-created with God very easily. You know, at the last uh, convention, I, I did a talk, and I mentioned this sign that I saw on Facebook, and it applies again here to this subject. It was something I saw on Facebook where it was a photograph of one of those signs with movable letters. And there was a first part of the statement that everybody in this room, I'm sure, has heard a million times. And then there was a second statement under it. And the first statement said, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And underneath there, it said, sometimes the reason is you are making some really bad decisions. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I'm talking about here. You know, you, you might be guided by, God, guided by God to something beautiful in your life, but if you let the ego take back over, you might start making decisions that undermine that and prevent you from sus sustaining it and maintaining it for any length of time. So another reason that things change on us, the ripple effect of decisions made by other people's egos. Other people's egos. You know, in 2006, I felt inspired to move my ministry from Dallas, Texas to Sedona, Arizona. Now, was that move really divinely inspired and divinely supported? I will tell you 100% absolutely. The number of miracles that, that helped Carol and I move here, the ease and grace of that, including, among the main things, the home we manifested here. I don't have the time this morning to tell you the details of that. But we manifested a beautiful home, almost against all, all odds, when things were falling apart even. We had faith that God would, would make this a true miracle in our lives and, and did. We had this beautiful home, and we you know, looked out at the Red Rocks, and just it was a great base for our ministry for a number of years. But that number was only three, a number of three years. After three years, we had to move because something changed. What changed? Well, in this, this instance, 2008 changed. There were a lot of people in the banking industry who were making ego decisions out of greed to give loans to people with home, to home, home loans to people who couldn't really afford them. And they didn't mind doing that because they knew they could sell that loan to another financial institution immediately, and that institution could also sell it to another institution and just kick that can down the road until finally those mortgages came due and people defaulted on them. And we, we all know what happened. Uh, the whole economic system kind of here collapsed for a while. 
So the reason that affected us, we were, we were renting this home, by the way, I failed to mention that. We were renting this home and we were going to rent it for indefinite, five years, ten years. We have no plans to, to not rent that for a really long time. Our homeowner was a real estate agent and she had multiple properties. So she was a little overextended. As a real estate agent, she wasn't selling anything anymore. All her homes were worth half, just generally one half of what her mortgage was on those things. And one thing led to another, and there was a domino effect, and her houses began to foreclose, be foreclosed on, including the one we were in. So we had to move. So in this instance, we manifested something miraculously, but due to the ripple effect of the ego decisions of people in the banking industry and others, something changed. Something changed for us. A third reason things change. Sometimes the manifestation of your dream was not really in the flow the whole way. Maybe it started to be. Maybe you got divinely guided, divinely inspired, you took the next right step, and then your ego says, hey, you could do this. You want to move that ball forward? You want to you know, take another step in this direction? Do this. And we do it. And we do another thing. And we do another thing. And we slip into forcing our way forward instead of rowing with the flow. We force our way forward just because we can. And that's, that's the lesson here. Just because you can do something and you can see this would work, this would move me forward, I can make this happen, that doesn't mean you should do it. You always, you know, when you're, when you're traveling through life, have to stop before every decision. Go within, seek that inner guidance, seek God's presence, and find out, should I be doing this? Or if I should, when? Or should I not be doing it at all? You've always got to judge, is, is this thing I'm thinking about doing in the flow or is it not? Don't just do something because you can. If you do, you will not be able to maintain and sustain what it is because you have forced it into being this before its time or before you were the kind of person you needed to be to maintain it and sustain it. Sometimes we need to grow a little bit along the way. So that's the third thing that the ego does. Here's a, here's a very unusual one. I love this one because it, <clears throat> I had never thought of it and then the woman told me the story. Sometimes the flow may lead you to the fulfillment of your dream just so you will finally realize it isn't right for you. <laughs> <laughs> there, a woman from Australia came to one of my workshops once. Her, her name was Robin. And she went back to Australia. And I, it was probably a year or two later. She slowly, you know, got up uh, the idea that she re had this lifelong dream that she really wanted to fulfill. And doors began opening for her. The dream was she wanted to leave Sydney, Australia, the big Sid city of Sydney, and move out into the outback, out into the country, into a very small town, and run a combination bakery and bookstore. So all of a sudden, after years of thinking about this and desiring it and f focusing on it, and doors began to open, other doors began to close, just everything moved her in that direction effortlessly, mirac miraculously. And she had her dream. She was there. She had the bookstore. She was all set up, ready to live her life's dream. And two things happened. One, she realized this was very hard work. <laughs> she, but that's beside the point. She, she wasn't enjoying it as much as she thought. But the worst thing is, she got no customers, no customers. She moved to a very small town where everybody knew everybody and had for generations. They didn't like strangers. They had no intention of giving her any business. So immediately it failed and she went back to Sydney in shame. However, once she got back to Sydney, she realized a few things. A, yeah, maybe she wasn't so keen on the big city, but she really liked all the cultural events there and things to do. B, her family lived there, and she was missing them when she was out in the country. And C, by being back in that environment and now open-minded and not so focused on the, the bakery and bookstore, she discovered her true soul's purpose. And a whole other career ahead of her started doing that and is to this day thriving and loving where she's living. So to me, what happened there was she was in the, God, it's like God saying, look, you're not going to be able to discover your soul's purpose as long as you're focused on that bookstore and bakery. So I'm going to help you get it. <laughs> and opened all these doors and, and moved her in that direction effortlessly, miraculously, only so she would realize, oh, this isn't what I thought it would be. And she could finally discover her true soul's purpose. So that's the fourth way that things change on us. Now, all the reasons I've mentioned so far have something to do with the ego in one way or another. 
But there are two more reasons that we experience change in our lives that are of a very deep spiritual nature. And they're probably the most important of the things I'm sharing today. First of all, you've got to remember that you are a divinely creative being, right? You are a divinely creative being. You know, one of the things we teach in metaphysics is that you are an individual expression of God, an individual expression of God. And one of the attributes of God is that God is creative. God is the great creator. Well, if, you are, if God is a, is a creator and, a, and creative energy, and you are an individual expression of God, what are you? You are a creator. You are a divine creator in your own right. And guess what? After you create something, after a while, you might want to create something else. <laughs> create a new. You know, a painter, take a painter. It does, he, a painter doesn't paint a masterpiece and then finish it up, put down his paints and said, I'm done, out. He picks up another canvas and begins another great masterpiece. And so sometimes we do the same thing. You might manifest something really great in your life. It was in the divine flow. You were divinely inspired, guided, and supported. But after a while, you might want to create a new. And you no longer perhaps give it the energy that you could. You, there's no longer the universe supporting that so much and helping you maintain that. And you move on to something else. Then there's the last thing that Dr. Masters mentions all the time. And that is... Sometimes we experience change in our lives because we need that change to grow in our spiritual awareness. We need the change to grow in our spiritual awareness. Notice I didn't say spiritual growth. <laughs> He's very keen on that to say you're not growing. Anymore. You're already perfect within. You know, your spirit is what it is. But we need to grow in our awareness of that. And it's through the challenge of change that we grow in our awareness uh, of our true nature and our true self. You know, we have the opportunity to do that. It's through the challenge of change, you know, we grow in our awareness of our oneness with God's presence within us. And it's through our challenge of change that we grow in our full potential as individual expressions of God and grow in our understanding that within us are those attributes of God that we can express of wisdom, of love, of creativity, and healing. You know, without the challenge of change, there is no motivation for self-examination or inner exploration, and our soul's journey just kind of comes to a standstill. So of all the reasons, that's probably the main one. You know, we have to have change because we're on this soul's journey. We're here for a purpose to learn and grow and remember who we are. And change allows you to do that. The status quo kind of doesn't. You're comfortable and you just sit there. So yes, for many reasons, and there's more than what I've talked about, Change in life is and will be constant. But thankfully, it is not the only constant. For God is also constant. And that means that God is constantly guiding you and supporting you and manifesting another good or even a higher good. You know, I talked about Carol and me having to leave that home that we love so much after just three years in Sedona. Well, one day... As it's getting time, we know the foreclosure's coming, we're going to have to leave this house, where will we go? We need to rent another house, how will we ever find a house as good as this one? All those thoughts go through our mind with a great view, can we rent it indefinitely, what will be the deal with that? One day, Carol was inspired, said, I need to go just go online and check something. So she goes online and says, home for rent, or whatever, she, whatever site she went to. Immediately, she found a home that was on the website, but we discovered soon afterwards, it hadn't even been listed anywhere else yet. It was on the internet, but there was no sign in front. Nobody knew that this house was gonna be available. It turned out it was in our same neighborhood. It was only two blocks away. It turned out that it was the same house. <laughs> now, what I mean by that is, not the one we were living in, but we live in a planned community. It was the exact same floor plan, just two blocks up. It had an even better view of the red rocks we were so proud of. It was $200 less per month than we had been paying for three years and went on that way for a long time. And because of a change in the circumstances of our homeowners and a change in our circumstances, we were able to finally buy that house. And now we own it. So 
that's a nice story. A little material, I guess. But, you know, to, to me, uh, you, if you're going to have a ministry, you need to have a, a, a nice base to work from. Uh, here's another story I want to share with you. I like, I like this one. Oh, we've got two minutes. I can do it. There's a woman I knew named Judy. And Judy uh, had a change in her circumstance where she needed to... Uh, she, she had lost, not lost her job, but she had quit her job because it, it was an abusive environment. And so she needed a new job that paid enough money to pay her rent. Well, guess what? She did find a new job. It paid her nothing, zero. But she took it because she didn't have to pay rent. The job was to live at a bed and breakfast inn, just live there. The deal was the owner of that inn wasn't there in the evening. She lived somewhere else. And she needed somebody to just live there so in the night, if there was a fire or a plumbing disaster or a medical emergency, there would be somebody there to take care of it, to call 911 or do whatever was necessary. So Judy's job was just live there. No rent. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy living in this big Victorian bed and breakfast inn. And uh, she can do anything else she wanted to do during the day. So she did find some work she wanted to do during the day. She became an uh, assistant to senior citizens. And she did that for a number of years. It was really her passion, made a lot of money in it. And then something changed. Oh, yeah, of course. The B&B &B went out of business. So what? <laughs> Judy had found her life's passion, assisting senior citizens, making plenty of money, and could live wherever she wanted. So she, with those changes, you know, came something better from God all along the way. So yes, change in life seems constant, but thank God, literally thank God, that change is not the only constant. God is also a constant. God's goodness is constant. God's grace is constant. God's love is constant. God's guidance is constant. So no matter what is shifting or changing in your life or how challenging that is, you can always take comfort in the constancy of God's presence. Thank you.